There's like a crashing spaceship sound. It's like a grating, like someone's doing obscene things to a violin to evoke these sounds. Hey everyone, it's Nicole. Welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, don't forget to subscribe. I like to post about books and music, mostly at Taylor Swift. Today I am continuing my Lana Del Rey discography series where I'm going through all of her albums in chronological order. I did react to Did You Know There's a Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard? And then I started working my way from the beginning with with the Lizzie Grant debut. I was really impressed with that one and I didn't expect to be. Today I'm going to be reacting to slash giving my review of Born to Die. So this is actually the only Lana album that I believe I've listened to all the way through. I know all of the songs on the standard edition. I also know Without You and Lolita. The only one I don't believe I've heard is one of the deluxe edition tracks, Lucky Ones. So this is the album that really got me into Lana Del Rey. I discovered it in the summer of 2013. It was very specific. I feel like it is a summer time album. It was released in I think January of 2012, but I'm glad I found it in the summertime. I wish I would have found it a year earlier, but with songs like Summertime Sadness and just this very Americana retro summery vibe to it. This album was everything to me and then I kind of just forgot about it. I grew out of my like super angsty 14 year old self. So now I'm revisiting it pretty much exactly 10 years later, <laughs> which feels insane. Oh my God, an entire decade. This is one of my favorite albums of all time. I believe it is Lana's most critically acclaimed, most popular album in terms of how well it did in relation to all of her other albums. But I know a lot of hardcore Lana fans don't think Think this is her best and I can't even say it's her best because I haven't listened to all of her albums but so far this is still my favorite I still prefer it to did you know there's a tunnel under ocean boulevard and Lizzie Grant comes close but I still think born to die is a lot better that's just out of the three that I've heard did you know that there's a tunnel under ocean boulevard is definitely growing on me but there are still some songs that I'm not super into as far as I remember born to die just hits every single song. It's been literally probably a decade or nine years since I've listened to it front to back. So we're gonna go through it and see if it still holds up. I believe that it will. If you want to skip around, there are timestamps down below and disclaimer, I will be listening to these through my headphones so that I don't get blocked for copyrights, but it's not gonna be that much of a reaction because I know what's coming and it's all just chef's kiss perfection. That like swirl of violins as an intro, what can I say? This orchestral pop is just so iconic. Even if this might not be her best album, like lyrically, it's definitely her most iconic. The way that this influenced so many other artists is kind of insane. I think there's a lot of consistent themes on this album, but I'm hoping at the gates they'll tell me that you're mine. Like this idea of like going to heaven. Dear Lord, when I get to heaven, please let me bring my man. The entire vibe of the album is heavenly. I kind of forgot all the instrumentation, so just being immersed in these violins again is so nice. It sounds so good. Also, when I really think about the culture that was happening at the time in 2012, I mean, of course we had Taylor Swift's Red, which kind of wallowed in heartbreak in a way, but it was also still a pretty optimistic album. It was very all over the place. It was about being heartbroken and still having a fun time despite that, like being surrounded by your girlfriends like in 22 and things like that. But Jesus Christ, the heads that rolled when like we have this very like Katy Perry type of vibe of like happiness and cotton candy and California girls. And that was like one of the most popular songs of this time. And here comes Lana with her like, we were just born to die. There's nothing you gotta do in life, but die. The road is long, we carry on, try to have fun in the meantime. It's this pessimism, even though she's describing like parties and it's got this loneliness in it. This just sadness that I think was very different for that time period. <laughs> this is like one of the best title tracks I think that has ever existed. The concept is just so strong, like the themes. We were born to die. I remember when I was 14, I couldn't hit those notes. <laughs> I've kind of developed a lower register now. I still can't hit some of the notes on Folklore though. Taylor goes so low in some of those songs. I'm just kind of floored after listening to that by the fact that there are people who are saying like, oh, but Lana's lyricism improves so much. This is not shallow. Like this is amazing lyricism. Maybe I'm just like not familiar enough with her newer works, but like, this is crazy. I mean, she does touch on a lot of interesting things in Did You Know There's a Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard, but I wouldn't say that is like leagues better than this. This is crazy, it's so good. 
Okay, we're like two seconds in. It's so playful. The bass line, it just has this skip to it. It contrasts a lot with the first song. Wait, there are children screaming in the background. I don't know if I ever noticed that. Or maybe it's not children, just like some audience. I don't know. Some of these drums remind me of the drums that happened in that one song on Lizzie Grant. It's like, you call me lavender, you call me sunshine. I forgot what it's called. Jesus Christ, the whole leader reference. <laughs> I literally specifically read Lolita before doing the series so I could like have a better understanding. <laughs> this went just completely over my 14 year old head. It's like very sugar baby. Yeah, okay, so it's like this sugar baby dynamic, like my old man is a bad man. It's like this old gangster, I don't know. But he doesn't mind that she's also corrupt even though she's younger than him. I think she was 24, which is the age I am now when she put this out. He doesn't mind that she's not completely innocent even though she's like still so much younger than him. and he's should like not be complaining. <laughs> Give me them gold coins, sugar baby. In the chorus, is she asking him to bail her out of jail? I never thought about that Rikers Island being a prison. I won't get out because I'm crazy. I need you to come here and save me. Like the gold coins like bail me out of prison. Yeah, it's like she's offering herself in exchange for him making her bail. <laughs> Has Lana ever even been imprisoned? I know she's had issues with alcohol. Like there's definitely some truth behind this crazy lifestyle she sings about but like has she ever even been arrested this is crazy the way she describes things he got a soul as sweet as blood red jam blood <laughs> like the juxtaposition of those he shows me he knows me every inch and you think she's gonna go like sensual with this like every inch of me or whatever like a physical thing every inch of my tar black soul i love it also he doesn't mind i have a flat broke down life in fact he says he thinks it's what he might like about me being you to manipulate the fact that she is broke obviously he could take advantage of her and be like i'll give you money if you do xyz for me or whatever i never thought about this i had taste without realizing why i had taste the vocal delivery of these two first songs are also so different because in born to die it's such a low register that sorry my cat just will not shut up it's such a lower register that she's singing it and it lends to the darkness of the song but then we have off to the races and it's so playful and it's so much higher i'm your little scarlet starlet like it's just so i guess all i can say is playful it's like this romanticization of something that is also pretty dark just like born to is the violins at the end i have goosebumps it's crazy iconic okay so what i have to add here is like okay so she's doing this lolita reference thing i don't think it's that she's trying to say that lolita is some kind of love story i think she's just quoting pieces of it that she found to be well written and creating an entirely separate story because first of all she's describing this like gangster man who's like all rich and while in lolita he takes this 12 year old girl on this like cross country road trip. I think she's inspired by that like crazy road trip and she's <laughs> me trying to justify this. A lot of people find this problematic. I'm trying to like give her creative liberties. I see where there's issues in misrepresenting the story, but it's like, just read the book. I don't know. She's not entirely responsible for that just cause people won't read. Going to Las Vegas, Coney Island, like this whole cross country thing. There's a parallel there. Obviously Humbert Humbert is not a gangster. He's, what was he, some kind of professor? There's no like glamour in it. He had money to like buy her some things that she wanted, but she was 12. She wanted like not the things that 24 year old Lana is looking for from an older man, but it's also like Lolita is not a 24 year old woman, even though there's like abuse happening here and definitely a power imbalance because this guy has money and she's like desperate and exchanging things for that. She's an adult. This is what she wants to do. Definitely not the best decision, <laughs> but I don't know completely how true it is. Like I know she had issues with alcohol and potentially drugs, but this is, I mean, her being imprisoned and like she's making herself out to be potentially crazier than she is. It's an interesting story. It's so dark. I wonder who actually inspired this. On Genius, it says Lana portrays a character which is a hybrid of her own image and Lolita that has a criminal past of alcohol stripping and overspending. 12 year old Lolita was not stripping and overspending. There's probably a million ways you could interpret this because of its kind of fictional inspirations. It's so classically American. I mean, this was the time of like Obama, you know, before it was like really, really shameful to like be American. <laughs> These classic things like blue jeans and Mountain Dew, National Anthem, so nostalgic. I love the very 2012 like background vocals that are happening and I think all of these songs so far. We've got this like stringed instrument that's like warbling. 
I don't know exactly what that is. I think it's an acoustic guitar. They're just playing it like really fast. You know what? And now I'm realizing blue jeans, white shirts. It was like James Dean for sure. It's this inspired style by Taylor Swift. Lana's influence. Oh my God, this is still inspiring Taylor. Love you more than those bitches before. All of the girls you've loved before, but I love you more or whatever that one is that was recently released. Hmm. This is an interesting chronological narrative that's happening. Big Dreams Gangster said you had to leave to start your life over i was like no please stay here we don't need no money we could make it all work and off to the races it's very obvious she's only interested in this old gangster man because he has money but it's like that codependent maybe at a certain point she forgot why she even got into this relationship in the first place because she got attached to him originally it was for money and then her priorities got all blurry you know what this one also reminds me of that lizzie grant song you call me lavender how do i even describe this there is a woodwind in the back that has that like snake charming sound again, similar to the outro of that Lizzie Grant song. I think it's just called Lavender. No, I don't think it is. I can't remember. Okay, so it seems when Lana has spoken about this song, she said this person had to leave because he got caught up in this like horrible lifestyle, whatever. But the way she sings about it in the bridge, like when he walked out that door, a piece of me died. We have all these like death metaphors. And she says, they took you away, stole you out of my life. Is this like the point in the storyline where the old gangster man like does die i mean you can interpret this multiple ways i don't think the actual lyrics are entirely true i guess i could see how this is maybe not the deepest story you know if lana got like better with her lyricism but the way it's written is really good even if the actual storyline maybe isn't that deep because it's about this old gangster man who dies sorry my cat is like moaning and then we have all these references happening in the album of like when i get to heaven let me bring my man dark paradise I think he dies. I don't know, I never realized this. I never thought about it in a chronological story order though. Yeah, so there's all this stuff about heaven and dying. Well, that's what you gotta prepare yourself for if you're gonna be with someone like four decades older than you. Okay, what happens next? <laughs> I feel like there is kind of a definitive storyline here. The violins, they hold up. The chords, the chord when she says loving you, I think it's some kind of seven chord. The lyrics are simple. It's definitely not her deepest work. Heaven is a place on earth with you. That's a cliche, but it's the delivery and the chords and I feel so sad while I'm listening to it. I think that's just her vocals. They say that the world was built for two only worth living if somebody's loving you. It's so simple. I think where the lyricism shines more is in the verses. That's where she gets more visual. The plucked violins in the second verse. The snare drum. It's so like 50s, like military. Why am I so sad when I listen to that? Maybe it's nostalgia. Like for some reason I associate it so much with like the time when I was 14. But the other songs are very nostalgic for me and I don't like feel so upset. This one just has something in it. There's like drugs in this, like sad time drugs. This was like one of my favorite ones back in the day. And then wasn't some kind of like demo version of it leaked recently that has a part that's like, hit me and tell me you're mine. I don't know why, but I like it. And it's like so different, but it's got such an interesting beat. Honestly, I love both versions. There's something just about Born to Die. I don't think it's just nostalgia because that demo hit really hard. And I was listening to it over the original. I love this beat immediately. At least she like picks us up after making us just like sob our eyes out at video games. That piano roll into the first verse is so classic. It's just that old Hollywood feeling that it evokes. Baby put on heart-shaped sunglasses. That's Lolita again, because we're gonna take a ride. He like kidnaps her in his car. The genius annotation is alarming. <laughs> it says Lolita is about themes of loss of innocence and humans. Maybe a little bit. I would say it's way more about an exploration of like the psychosis behind pedophiles for sure. Cause it's from his point of view. We don't really see how she feels about it, which is sad. She's so like objectified. To him, she's nothing more than just like something that he'll use until she's not attracted to him anymore when she like goes through puberty. It's so much more about how our culture almost like enables these people to act like this. Also it says in Lolita she finds herself curious about something she shouldn't be, her stepfather, just as how Lana shouldn't be pursuing this bad guy. That is not the same. <laughs> Also, to blame 12 year old Lolita for having like interest in her stepfather, she has like a little crush on him before she, he marries her mother. There's nothing actually wrong with that. It's how the adult responds. Jesus. I see the problems because like it becomes an issue if people didn't actually read it and they just take her interpretation or 
creative liberties is fact. This beat freaking slaps though. This like cigarette metaphor, she's like personifying herself as a cigarette. Take another drag, turn me to ashes. She's like telling him to use her. The second verse isn't crazy deep, but the interesting line is let's take Jesus off the dashboard. Got enough on his mind. She doesn't want him watching her behavior. I like her religious references and her struggles with behaving in this way, but also having this faith so obviously. The way she begs the Lord to let her bring her man to heaven. I mean that you're no good for me, but baby, I want you as a classic staple to these kinds of pop songs. Taylor Swift sings, you look like bad news, I gotta have you in 22. She looks so much like Elvis's wife, Priscilla Presley. Money is the anthem of success, so before we go out, what's your address? I don't think this is like her actual viewpoint. I think this is like maybe the mindset she encountered in Los Angeles. Like before someone will even hang out with you, they want to know what neighborhood you're from. But like nowadays, it's like how many followers you have. This is interesting. It's giving like Gatsby, which she had her song Young and Beautiful in the movie. Wait, is that how I like found out about Lana Del Rey? I think it is because I remember I saw The Great Gatsby in 2013 in like May or something when it came out. I heard Young and Beautiful and it's just been downhill since there. I like her progression in this song. We see like time spanning. He says to be cool, but I don't know how yet. It's interesting because she's like looking for this money and she like will not give someone her time if they don't have the correct address. But he's like, you need to behave a certain way. And she's like, I don't know how. So it's like, <laughs> she has this, these expectations that she can't even fulfill herself. She asks him if they can party. He said, yes, she has to ask for like permission in this world where it's all about like your behavior. He said to be cool, but I'm already coolest. She adapts quickly in the second verse. I never noticed the background vocals, like what she was actually saying. Booyah, baby, bow down, making me say wow now. Like she has to keep up this fascination in the same way she was fascinated in the beginning, even though she gets used to it because otherwise he's gonna like be tired of her because she needs to have this like wide-eyed wonder at everything he does. Bow down to him. That's so degrading. Oh my God. Priorities though. The line red, white, blue is in the sky, summer's in the air and baby heaven's in your eyes is so iconic. So she like accepts she has to give him something in return like this never-ending admiration in exchange for him accepting her into this lifestyle but she's like tell me i'm your national anthem like she also wants to be worshipped it doesn't really work out that way does it the bridge is so fast-paced it's hard to like catch everything as you're listening it's a love story for the new age i would argue this is not a symbol of modern times like this is a tale as old as time she has this calculation when she says he will do very well i can tell i can tell like it seems like she's sitting in this penthouse hotel room he's put her up in and she's like observing how well he does business <laughs> yeah this is another wild ride similar to off to the races i think i love this like fake naivety she's portraying to like manipulate him i guess even though he's probably manipulating her as well because of this power imbalance he has the money and she doesn't um do you think you'll buy me lots of diamonds <laughs> but um also it's interesting that she's like essentially telling this story about being a gold digger but i don't think that the stereotype is always entirely accurate because there is a power imbalance like whoever has the money is always going to have some kind of upper hand and she kind of explores that in this like she knows she's kind of manipulating him in some ways pretending she like knows less than what she actually does he says to be cool but i don't know how yet she knew exactly what she was doing and what she was going for and this like um do you think you'll buy me lots of diamonds like do you think she knows he will <laughs> but then there's elements of this toxicity that's coming from him as well he's actually getting benefit out of this as well. Some people think it's about John F. Kennedy and both Jackie and Marilyn. I don't see any references, but I might not know enough about them. This was also one of my favorites. I think this is gonna be a point where it follows the storyline more of blue jeans and even kind of a continuation of Born to Die because of all the death references. Okay, she said this was written for a boyfriend who died a couple of years prior. <laughs> That's so sad. But the song itself is recalling an undying love for her bad boy lover. I think she's taking inspiration from a bunch of different relationships for each of these songs, but I think it kind of follows this storyline that is fictional. It's interesting how she blurs that, blurring the lines between real and the fake. The Oz. Ah, that part, oh my god. It feels like a siren song, like I'm lying in the ocean. It's got mermaid vibes. I love the production on all of these. They all like match so well, but they're all such different songs at the same time. I just heard a new background vocal when she says, but I wish I was dead. I thought she was just saying dead again in the background. She says dead like you. 
that changes things. It's so simple, but it's just so sad. No one compares to you. I'm scared that you won't be waiting on the other side. Jesus Christ, Lana. I'm not good. She's really grappling with this religious background and whether or not she actually believes like people end up somewhere in the afterlife or even like what all it takes to get you disqualified, I guess, from arriving at the gates. Let me bring my man, even though he's done horrible things. Yeah, that like you is so subtle, but it's there. I mean, she's clearly stating what happened to this love interest. This beat again, like the post chorus before the bridge. It's so good. Oh, the shimmery sound right before the bridge. I love that. Sweeping violins before the last chorus too. Like everything about this just hits. I think that contributes a lot to the overall feeling of the song, like it just feels so dramatic. And the lyrics are like good, and I like the overall concept, dark paradise, like this, these contrasting words, like it's heaven to be able to remember these things, but like ultimately you wake up upset because it's not real. But the rest of the lyrics, no one compares to you, there's no you, except in my dreams tonight. Like it's really not that deep, but something about it is still just so effective. I'm sad. Yeah, I think this is kind of a storyline happening that I know Never really considered before of like the born to die blue jeans they took you away stole you out of my life and then we see what ultimately happened to him even though this is based on a real person kind of i think she's adding these elements of fiction and creating this really interesting fictional narrative I like how she pronounces vitamin like British people, but she is definitely American. <laughs> hmm, is that some kind of like contrasting commentary because she like romanticizes these old American ideals, but then she has this subtle British pronunciation in this song. I feel like that means something. <laughs> okay, so she's coming back to life. Something is making her see a reason to continue. Boy, I've been raised from the dead. And it's like, life was so hard. I don't even think about it because I finally found you. Love me because I'm playing on the radio. I don't know if this is necessarily about a person. She says, I finally found you. I think she's talking about fame or like her fans maybe. Now my life is sweet like cinnamon, like coming into this fame and fortune that she's always wanted. How do you like me now? I think it's this bitterness for anybody who's ever said she couldn't do it. Just being pleased at overcoming like what Dark Paradise was about. American dreams came true somehow. I swore I'd chase them till I was dead. I like how she like tears us down and then lifts us up and then tears us down and then lifts us up. Yeah, now I'm in LA and it's paradise. This contrasts to that like LA crossway, this like dark side of LA and in National Anthem, she said, before we go out, what's your address? That's probably a more LA mindset. She says something about this song. People will come out of the woodwork and change their mind about you. They'll start to like you because you're on the radio. And it is true, but I don't mind because I'd rather have people be nice to me. So I liked it. I don't really care why people are nice to me. I just like it when it's easier. Oh my God. This like hints to some kind of background where it's like you just are begging for someone to be kind to you. Well, I mean, with these kinds of guys she was pursuing. Also, I do think there is this hint of like, yeah, I'm having a good time now and in this moment I am very happy because things are easier. But to say my life is sweet like cinnamon, cinnamon is not sweet. <laughs> like it'd be one thing if she said like cinnamon sugar or like, I don't know, but it's obviously, it seems ironic to say it's sweet like cinnamon. It's like saying it's sweet like jalapenos. Yeah, even in this, she's kind of admitting it's not completely all that it's cracked up to be or all that she's kind of raving about in the rest of this song. If I remember correctly, this was another sad one. <laughs> Dramatic violin. Okay, so supposedly this is about a fictional protagonist named Carmen who's 17 years old. Obviously Lana was older than that when she was writing this, but it's a self-insertion song. I mean, this is based on her experience with her alcohol issues when she was a teenager, she's talked about. I think she's creating a character based on her own experiences. And it's one of those classic tales of like, she has this crazy problem, but it's like, oh, she can be so charming. Everyone just admires her. She says to them, you don't actually want this. Famous and dumb at an early age. But what's interesting is Lana didn't reach fame when she was 17, when she was a teenager having these alcohol problems. Maybe it's a commentary on both phases of her life and if they were to coincide at the same time, what that would look like. Like if she were to have become famous even younger when she was having these problems at 17. She sings it with this princess please. <laughs> she sings it with this almost motherly scolding Carmen, Carmen, staying up till morning. Maybe this is someone she encountered and she's just kind of blending all of 
the stories together, her own autobiographical ones, as well as fiction based on someone she might have met. Streetwalk at Night and A Star by Day. The 17 year old is a prostitute? Wait a second. No, I remember. This is kind of another Lolita reference. There's not really a character named Carmen in the book. He like sings this song to Dolores. That's another way he objectifies her. Her name is not Lolita, it's Dolores and he like decides to call her Lolita because he likes the name better. She's very much an object to him but he like sings this song to her to distract her from the assault that he's doing to her and it's about some girl named Carmen and it's supposed to be like a funny little song. I can't remember exactly what the content of it was because there were more disturbing things going on in that scene but yeah I think that's where she maybe got the name. It reminds me of the song that came before this one, Radio, where she kind of talks about this contrasting feeling of like fame like everybody wants to be like Carmen but like there's a dark side to it or like fame looks sweet like cinnamon. I like the pun that exists in the hook. You look like a million dollar man, so why is my heart broke? I'd follow you down, down, down. Baby, I'm falling down from off to the races. I don't think I have too much to say about this one. I mean, the themes are very consistent. This kind of feels like blue jeans, like other than the whole death references, it feels like he just kind of got caught up in some bad business and like lost his money. Not the most ethical person, but that's who Lana goes after, or at least this character. It's really simple. It's got a nice sound, jazzy. This this was always one that wasn't like one of my top favorites back in the day. It's still, it's fine. I definitely think it's a good song. I don't think I would skip it, but I think there are other songs on this album that have this kind of theme and do it a little better. The iconic Tumblr anthem. Oh, I miss Tumblr. Mine got hacked in like 2020 and I couldn't get back into it because I was using an email that I don't have access to anymore. I'm really sad. I had like, like a good several thousand followers on there and now I can't even post anything. I can delete things, but I can't post. The visuals of this. Okay, we have this pale moonlight, which I think this is the first time she's singing about pale moonlight. She's singing about a red dress, which she's done several times already on this album. I think she's sang about pale moonlight several times before later on. High heels, red dress, pale moonlight, all these visuals that are like classic Lana. Telephone wires above are sizzling like a snare. I never realized that's what she was saying and that's so interesting. I didn't know telephone lines hiss when they're wet, like after it rains. That's kind of terrifying. Another electricity reference, I'm feeling electric tonight. Got my bad baby by my heavenly side. I know if I go I'll die happy tonight, very born to die. Dark paradise. She's consistent. Even the drum feels reminiscent of Dark Paradise. Like this feels like it's elaborating more on that a little bit. Even if you're gone, I'm gonna drive. Yeah, it's got like death themes. I think I'll miss you forever. It's like the opposite of seasonal depression. That bridge is beautiful. It's so short and simple, but like the visuals of it, it's so like poetic. And it seems a little optimistic at the end. Even if you're gone, I'm gonna drive. When previously she was kind of like, if I go, I'll die happy tonight. And it's like, she feels this person's gonna leave her eventually. This feels like a precursor to Wildest Dreams, even though Wildest Dreams is also a ripoff of Without You <laughs> melodically. The concept here is like similar. Even if you're gone, I'm gonna drive. Like I'll honor all these summertime memories we had and like cruise down the coast even if it's without you. I see why this is like one of her most popular songs. I love the beat. I also think the lyrics are just so interesting. There she was, my new best friend. High heels in her hands, swaying in the wind. This is a drunk girl swaying in the wind, sure. Stumbling. She starts to cry, mascara running down her little Bambi eyes. This reminds me of her like cartoon eyes and Carmen. I wonder if Carmen, yeah, it could be based on someone she met while she was also 17. Lana, how I hate those guys. <laughs> it's one of those classic girlhood theme songs. This is what makes us girls. We all look for heaven, religious references, again and we put love first something that we die for it's a curse we don't stick together because we put love first that is not the girl code lana it's like her own set of rules like that her and her friends follow maybe more than girls as a whole this is like the first time she's really talking about her own moral compass i think it's the closing track because it explains all of her behavior from the past 11 songs why she's so reckless because she was like raised this way with a bunch of other teenage girls all fending for themselves chasing after guys and like doing drugs and alcohol it's a good conclusion. Outro is interesting. It's got this like shouty vocal splicing. Yeah, I never realized how much this was kind of like a conclusion to the entire album. Like this is why I am the way that I am. And she like details her entire teenagehood before she got sent away to boarding school. I didn't even realize that was something that happened to her. So a lot of this went over my head. I didn't know much about her when I was younger. I like how it's a story. Like she tells how it progresses. All this crazy stuff is happening. They're drinking alcohol. They're doing drugs, getting with like older men, whatever. Her parents start to get concerned for her. That's where the beginning of the end begun. Everybody knew we had too much fun meeting like her parents. We were skipping school and drinking on the job. 
and then she pauses before saying with the boss oh my god the like little things she tacks onto the end of some of these sentences with like a pause and then she's like it is so much worse like to be skipping school and drinking while you're a teenager it already sounds bad enough but then to tack on that it's like happening with these adults who should have been like watching them more closely sweet 16 and they're table dancing at the local dive well i guess that's how it is in like small towns maybe you're able to like get in like corruption with bouncers maybe the memories that are like injected into this song running from the cops in our black bikini tops screaming get us while we're hot it's like kind of humorous but it's like sad it's like obviously she has this nostalgia for it and you can feel it even though she's like this was not what we should have been doing she looks back in hindsight and she's like oh, we were insane but it's like a special place in her heart. Freshman generation of degenerate beauty queens. She talks about like seniors and freshmen. It's so high school. And you know something? They were the only friends I ever had. The loneliness, my god. I never realized she was saying we got into trouble and when stuff got bad, I got sent away. I was waving on the train platform crying because I know I'm never coming back. Well, it's like maybe getting sent away was for the best for her because where are those girls now who didn't get sent away? And look at where Lana is now. Well, first of all, I hear there's a demo that's very different. I want to listen to that before I go into the bonus tracks. What is this? Plucked violins? And I think it's a different vocal take. There's so much more vocal fry. Ooh, the notes are different. Firelight. <laughs> instead of firelight. It's so much more electronic, like EDM-y. Oh my god, this would not fit on the Born to Die album. It's so modern. It's like, this is crazy. This is so 2010s. When Born to Die is such a like different album for the 2010s, it's one of the more unique ones of that time period. I think it's faster. Okay, she changed drinking cherry schnapps in the Velvet Night. She said drinking Perion. That's expensive, isn't it? Compared to cherry schnapps. I think the cherry schnapps makes more sense. Instead of saying, get us while we're hot, get us while we're hot she said something like get us while we're hot we don't give a what that's i'm glad she changed it to repeating the line twice okay we do have the classic born to die violins coming in at the end finally i still don't think it's enough though yeah i'm glad she changed it up people are saying this one feels more upbeat i don't think with lyrics like this you can really have a song that is that upbeat it just feels more like club music it feels more like it's in the atmosphere of when it's actually happening but the one that ended up on the album feels more like she's looking back at her teenage hood which i think is more accurate to the song because she wrote it later in her life and of course the sonically cohesive aspects of the production it makes a lot more sense chronologically on the album especially as a closer in the version that ended up on the album remix of video games i don't think it needs a remix okay convince me this is awful what is this it's like club music again okay now it's adding a dreamy violin-y thing to it but like it's missing piano i don't like the do -do 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 in the background it's too morse code for me if they took out the percussion and that weird do -do 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 it might be kind of interesting that morse code sound just won't leave now it's got like a broken printer in the background what the fuck am i listening to it's such a beautiful song and now they're just like butchering it yeah i can't find anything redeemable about that one maybe it was a little bit promising in the very beginning with the surging sweeping electronic violin thing but it just doesn't hold a candle to the original there's a reason that one went viral and this one absolutely didn't I feel like I'm just gonna hate the remixes because this has such a distinct classic sound and especially if it's like a 2010 decade remix it's just gonna sound like horrible dubstepy club music okay a snare drum I wasn't expecting that where are they going with this it's giving action movie oh this is weird it doesn't match it's not that bad but why is her voice so quiet it sounds like some kind of Jurassic Park instrumental okay so it keeps the original violins but it does this horrible electronic thing that's like a beep boop 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 trumpets okay wait the brass section's cool i like the brass section the drums are weird though it's giving like lion king <laughs> i hate that doo -doo 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 -doo. ew why did they turn it into such a we were born to die <laughs> no god if they wouldn't have done that i think the brass is interesting i think it fits like it's orchestral okay it's just violins and her voice for the lost but now i am found section okay i like this part don't make me sad don't make me cry and it's like the brass and a snare drum and i think it fits it's not as good as the original but it's not like terribly out of place but then they bring in that thing and and here we go again with the do 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 the stomp clap beat is just killing me the snare drum horn outro is cool i still don't like the stomp clap drum that's behind the snare drum not as bad as the other one but still not good yeah it's a no from me 
This definitely inspired Wildest Dreams. This has so much sadness in the intro. I get why this isn't on the standard edition because it, it starts to get a little bit repetitive, I think. It's a gorgeous song, but the themes, she's not really adding anything new to the narrative. She's like, I'll give up my fame for you, basically. I like the line, I can be your China doll if you want to see me fall, like this desperation to please somebody that you'll like harm yourself. I feel like that has been repeated already on some of the songs. They all think I have it all, I'm nothing without you. Carmen, like someone being envious of this person, maybe their life isn't as great as it seems. Summertime is nice and hot, so this contrasts to that summertime sadness, like this happiness in it. My life is sweet like vanilla. It's like the cinnamon one, and for a second I was like, oh, okay, something that's actually sweet, but like vanilla extract pure is so bitter, so it's ironic again. Gold and silver lie in my heart. She's like made up entirely of materialistic possessions. She calls herself a china doll. She's like this, she's objectifying herself. She's like a pretty expensive thing that's not like human. And that contrasts with the born to die idea, this like coming to terms with your own mortality. But then later on she's like, I'm just a doll. I'm made of gold and silver. This burned into my brain are these stolen images. Stolen images, can you picture it, babe, the life we could have lived. In another song she was like basically saying I'll give up all these ambitious dreams for you. I already forgot which one it is. God, why is it escaping me? But yeah, basically, she's already kind of saying about these things, so. Oh, American Dream. She talks about American Dream in radio. American Dream came true somehow. Dark side of the American Dream. That's like the entire concept of radio. When we grew up, nothing was what it seemed. That reminds me of this is what makes us girls. And also Carmen a little bit, like losing your childlike innocence. Or how looking back on this is what makes us girls, she's like, this was actually terrible. And I can feel nostalgic for it while also recognizing I was stupid. I like the pulsing bass line in the brain. Yeah, that's another one of my favorites, but I am starting to see why it was left off. It was a strategic decision. I also feel like a 12 track long album is pretty good, especially for like an early album when you haven't really established yourself yet in the industry. It keeps people's attention. Standard edition is less than an hour long. Now we have Lolita, which I probably have a bone to pick with, but also I understand creative liberty and it's not her fault if like stupid people want to think she's actually quoting the book and how it goes. Like just read the freaking book and you'll understand what it's about. Don't take Lana's summary too seriously. I love these violins. They're so vintage. I see where it's like, okay, in her narrative, she's inspired by Lolita because of the aesthetic, but she's like aging her up to make it more about like a 24 year old woman and a 60 year old man or whatever. But like Lolita is about a little girl who's 12. She's not even a teenager yet and a 40 something year old man. And when Lana says stuff like could be kissing my fruit punch lips in the bright sunshine, it doesn't sound like it's about a 24 year old woman. <laughs> like maybe unless it's some kind of infantile fetish. I don't know. That's where it's like, or maybe she's just kind of going based off of Humbert Humbert's delusions because he tries to convince the reader that what he did was justified because Dolores wasn't actually a child. Child. She was some kind of, he calls her a nymphet, like she was some kind of seductress when really she's a child and it's just his warped perspective, which is what makes it so interesting. Maybe she is writing from his perspective, even though it's first person from Dolores's perspective. It's tricky. This is what he's convincing the reader is what she actually said to him, if that makes sense. I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt because otherwise it's so icky. Yeah, I think it's from his perspective how he thinks it happened because supposedly Dolores is like, it's you that I adore though I make the boys fall like dominoes, like little boys her age have a crush on her but she wants her stepfather, supposedly, according to him. But oh my god, throughout the book you see her outbursts and how desperately she tries to get away from him. But he's like so delusional, he thinks she wants him. Ugh, it's so messed up. Something I didn't know about until I actually read the book was that the girl Dolores actually tries to pimp her friends off to him because she's so tired of being abused. She's like, can't you just do this to these other 12 year old girls instead of me? It's so messed up. Oh shit. Okay, I always thought she was saying kiss me in the dark, D-A-R-K. She repeats it, but she says kiss me in the park. I can't defend her <laughs> when she says things like that. Unless she really is just trying to show how Humbert thought it happened. The instrumentation slaps though. The production, I'm obsessed with it. Questionable content, but as long as you can acknowledge that, I think you can enjoy it. Okay, so the chorus is like, hey Lolita, hey, like these boys are calling to her, like come play with us, whatever. Yeah, this has to be from Humbert's perspective because no boy would be calling Dolores Lolita. He's the only one who thinks of her as that. So this is more of his delusions. It has to be from his perspective. This seductress who's a child. He has this idea that she's like leaving all these boys her age behind because she just wants him because he's 
so fucking delusional. No more skipping rope. Ew, <laughs> I'm gonna be with this grown ass man. Sure, Humbert, sure, that's what happened. <laughs> it's actually kind of interesting. It's like his recount of how it happened, but in song form and it slaps. Ew, and all the like dark and like the sun going down stuff because like he had to keep it hidden that he was abusing her. She wanted to go out with boys so badly. He was abusing her for a very long time. And once she was like in high school, like 13, 14 years old, she wanted to go on dates and he wouldn't let her. He would call it infidelity. The bridge is interesting. So I really think it is from his perspective because otherwise, ew. The romanticization of it is so gross. So in his head, when she says like, oh, I want to date these boys my age, it's not her saying, I want to stop being abused by you. It's her saying like, oh, I want to date these boys and be with you. Have my cake and eat it too. I want to have fun and be in love with you. She doesn't, but he thinks that's what she's saying. He's like misinterpreting everything because he's crazy. He's literally a psychopath. And then she says, I know that I'm a mess with my long hair and my suntan short dress bare feet. I don't care. It's also interesting because when you read it, he's like kind of disgusted by some of her behavior because she's a child and she like doesn't want to wash her hair and he like starts to get grossed out by that. But it's like be with a grown woman who can clean herself. I don't know. <laughs> he tries to turn her into a woman when she's a child. And it's just like, yeah, the way she runs around and like plays in the dirt. And he's like, this is not proper but it's like get with a woman your own age <laughs> yeah i'm just gonna take it as his own delusional recount of what happened because a huge clue is that these other boys are calling her lolita when he's the only one who calls her this and he doesn't even tell anyone that he does i think the movie also twists things up though because like the movie shows everything that's happening according to him and in the book you understand it's his written recount and he's an unreliable narrator but when you see things actually happening in the movie it's all from his own memory but the audience doesn't really understand that they think it's like what they're seeing is what they're getting when in reality it's how he remembers things so it does look like she's the seductress that he paints her out to be and that's i think where there's a problem with the visual adaptation of it that might be where she's getting mixed up with it unless she did read it i don't know that one's the sketchiest out of all of the lolita references for sure it's the most obvious one obviously it's literally named after the book. Please no more Lolita references for the rest of this album. I am begging. <laughs> I've never heard this one. Let's get out of this town. Wait, Taylor was inspired by this too. He said, let's get out of this town. Drive out of the city away from the crowds. This is so dramatic. It's got tambourine, crackling static of a record player. It's got a heartbeat in the back too, as percussion. Wow, well, Taylor was really inspired by this song. The heartbeat reminiscent drum. Taylor actually used her real heartbeat. Could it be that you and me are the lucky ones? Her the lucky ones? song. There's a record scratch going on again in the second verse. Usually you only see those effects at the beginning of songs or at the very end. The bridge is magical. The violins! I've said that so many times. Great outro. Again that record static. Is that a harp? I feel like there actually might have been a lot of harp with this album and I'm only just now noticing it. What an outro. Ooh, that being the final closer to the album. A really good way to end such an orchestral album. Orchestra pop. We need to bring that back. <laughs> It was so short-lived. I see why it was not included. It just is a lot more generic lyrically. I think she goes into a lot more interesting wording on the songs that made the standard edition. I don't really see why Lolita got taken off other than, you know, the fact that it could be interpreted as like she's enabling Humbert's perspective because she's kind of like giving him a platform in that way of like, it feels so validating to what he thinks happened. So I could see how the content would be controversial, but my God, it's a bop. That one, I think that's the only reason she maybe didn't put it on the standard edition. Okay, now another video games remix. Fucking kill me. I'm ready to be unimpressed. Eight minutes long? What did they do to her? Oh god, it's got like a basketball on a gym floor beat just in the beginning. How long is that gonna go on? Still going. 20 seconds of uninterrupted basketball. There's a frying pan sizzle added to it now. 30 seconds of basketball frying pan sizzle. Now we have some alien spaceship panning like crazy. I hate it already. It sounds like there's a chorus that's all spliced up into the back. She still hasn't started singing yet and we're over a minute in. There she is. It's like get your head in the game, but like Lana Del Rey version. Now it's got a strange bass line in the second verse. It's not like terrible, but we still have this bouncing basketball in the background. Is it ever gonna go away? Yeah, it's too electronic. It, it is like the that jellyfish song from SpongeBob. <laughs> However it went, the jellyfish house party song. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is like not Lana at all. Like give me the old Hollywood, the orchestra. Where is it? I just have Troy Bolton and the Jellyfish House Party. Nickelodeon Disney mashup. There's like a crashing spaceship sound. It's like a grating, like someone's doing obscene things to a violin to evoke these sounds. And it's just really giving Jellyfish House Party. Someone's like drunk in a symphonic recording studio. This is atrocious. <laughs> Who did this to her? Also, they have these huge breaks where she's not singing for like any stretch of time at all. And it's just filled with this grating, terrible noises. God, when is this over? Can I speed it up? Okay, now it does like a, one of those beat surge thingies where like the beat drops and it's like whoosh. Not terrible. Oh god, now she's coming back and she's all like, it's you, it's you. It's just a conglomerate freaking mess. Okay, now we have piano, but it's not like pretty piano. It's like electronic crazy piano. All they have her singing is it's you, it's you, it's all for you. And then they're just doing crazy shit in the background. Who let them do this? It sounds freaking spooky. I hear like a train approaching. What is this? Do they know what this song is about? Like, are they okay? Got the dribbling basketball at the very end. <laughs> what is that? My ears have been assaulted, um, so that was terrible. Um, but otherwise, this is an amazing album. <laughs> And I usually like to give like my favorite tracks at the very end of these kinds of album reactions, but mm, there's not a single skip. Born to Die is even better than I remember. That was never like one of my top top faves because I think upon first discovering it, it was just very overwhelming and I had a very quick, short, Born to Die phase, and my favorites at that point in time I remember were Dark Paradise, and I quite liked Blue Jeans and Diet Mountain Dew. Those were probably my three really up there ones. As of now, now that I've discovered Lolita, that one hits, like, oh my god, it's so good. Lolita, Born to Die, I kind of slept on that one for way too long after my whole obsession in 2013. Maybe Blue Jeans? I don't know. My tastes have kind of changed a little bit, but I can still really, really appreciate Die Mountain Dew, Dark Paradise, and what was it, Summertime Sadness? I also like video games now more than I did when I was younger because it just makes me feel so nostalgic and sad, and I didn't like the slower ballads when I was younger and when I was first listening to this. And I remember not really liking Million Dollar Man that much, but I have a newfound appreciation for it. So my view of this album has changed a little bit over time. This is my favorite one I've listened to so far, but again, I've only listened to three. We will We'll see if one of her newer albums surpasses this one for me. It's just crazy how good this is. Let me know if you agree or not down in the comments. Last time my comment section was very conflicting. Some people were like, man, she gets so much better than Born to Die, just wait. And some other people were like, yeah, Born to Die is the easiest to get into. It holds up like crazy. It's the most commercially successful. Like there's a reason for all of this, you know? But I'm definitely going into the future albums with a very open mind. I will be reviewing and reacting to a Paradise EP two weeks from when this video goes out. Next week I have a Taylor Swift video planned that I filmed back in December and I'm just now getting to like editing and posting. So quick break for a Taylor Swift video and then we're gonna go right back into the Lana reactions. So don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you can keep up with those videos. I will have a Lana Del Rey playlist linked down in the description. If you want to follow me on my Instagram it is right here and if you want to follow me on my TikTok it is right here. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Comment down below your top three songs on the Born to Die album. I feel like it's very difficult to pick. I have my 2013 top three and then my 2023 top three, so maybe you might have to do something like that if this is an album you've known as long as I have. Yeah, I will see you next week for a Taylor Swift video, and I hope you have an amazing day. Bye, guys.